fluid surrounding the cells in the body must maintain a specific concentration of electrolytes for the cells to function properly. Let's look more closely at how electrolyte homeostasis is maintained in the body. Your goals for learning are to recognize that electrolytes must be maintained in a narrow concentration range in order for cells to function properly. To examine in general how electrolyte composition of the fluid compartments are maintained. To learn the importance of sodium, potassium, and calcium homeostasis. To learn the consequences of disturbances of sodium, potassium, and calcium homeostasis. To examine how fluid movement is regulated in the body. Here's what you need to know. How ADH, aldosterone, and the sympathetic nervous system work to maintain fluid homeostasis. The principles of colloid osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure. The function of the nephron. To see definitions of terms, click the bold red words. Electrolytes are a major component of body fluids. They enter the body in the food we eat and the beverages we drink. Drag the milkshake to the figure's mouth to see how electrolytes enter and leave the body. While electrolytes leave the body mainly through the kidneys by way of the urine, they also leave through the skin and feces. Severe vomiting and diarrhea can cause a loss of both water and electrolytes from the body, resulting in both water and electrolyte imbalances. The concentrations of electrolytes in body fluids must be maintained within specific limits, and even a small deviation outside these limits can have serious or life-threatening consequences. In this topic, we will concentrate on the three most clinically significant electrolytes, sodium ions, potassium ions, and calcium ions. One of the important functions of electrolytes, particularly sodium, is to control fluid movement between fluid compartments. The movement of fluid across the cell membrane differs from the movement of fluid between the interstitial compartment and plasma. The cell membrane acts as a barrier to separate intracellular and interstitial fluid compartments. Electrolytes move across the cell membrane through channels and ion pumps that are selective for specific ions. Click the sodium-potassium ion pump to see the active transport of sodium and potassium. Channels specific for sodium ions allow these ions to diffuse from areas of higher to areas of lower concentration. In most cells, the sodium channels don't allow sodium ions to move across the membrane very quickly.
The channels specific for potassium ions allow these ions to move across the membrane fairly quickly from areas of higher to areas of lower concentration. Differences in ion concentration between intracellular and interstitial fluids are caused by these selective ion channels and ion pumps in the cell membrane. These differences make the membrane potential possible and they facilitate a number of important physiological processes. We have seen how ions move across the cell membrane. Now let's show water movement across the membrane. The cell membrane is freely permeable to water, which moves from the area of higher water concentration to lower water concentration. Now click the interstitial compartment to add more sodium to the interstitial fluid. When there is a higher concentration of solute in the interstitial fluid, which way will water move? Drag a water molecule in the correct direction. Water will move from the inside to the outside of the cell. Through osmosis, water moves to the side of the membrane with the higher solute concentration or the lower water concentration. You can see how sodium exerts a significant osmotic effect on water and therefore affects its movement. We've seen how water moves between the intracellular and interstitial fluid compartments. Fluid movement between the interstitial compartment and plasma is quite different from the movement between the interstitial compartment and intracellular compartment. Click an endothelial cell to see how fluids move between plasma and interstitial fluid. Ions, other small solutes, and water can move freely between the plasma and the interstitial fluid through gaps between endothelial cells. In most cases, proteins are too big to leave the capillaries. Proteins that do escape from the blood capillaries are removed by the lymph capillaries and are moved back into the plasma by way of the lymph. Click the arrow representing the fluid movement that results from this osmotic effect. Remember that the increased protein concentration in the plasma pulls fluid into the plasma. The protein exerts an osmotic effect and water will move from the interstitial fluid into the plasma. The osmotic effect of the protein and the hydrostatic pressure oppose each other. At the arterial end of a capillary bed, the hydrostatic pressure is typically stronger than the osmotic effect of the protein and forces fluid, along with nutrients, into the interstitial fluid space. At the venous end of a capillary bed, the osmotic effect of the protein is greater than the hydrostatic pressure and there is a net movement of fluid containing carbon dioxide and wastes into the plasma. This exchange of fluids between the interstitial space and plasma is called bulk flow. The net result of bulk flow is fluid movement out of the capillary at the arterial end and into the capillary at the venous end. This process allows for nutrient waste exchange. Click the plasma to increase the sodium concentration. What would happen to the concentration of sodium ions in the interstitial fluid? Sodium would move into the interstitial fluid followed by water. What effect would an increase in sodium concentration have on the cells that are bathed by the interstitial fluid? Right, the cells will shrink. The high concentration of sodium and other small solutes in the extracellular fluid exerts significant osmotic pressure on cells and contributes to determining the fluid levels in the intracellular compartment. Edema is an accumulation of fluid in the interstitial compartment and can occur either locally, in a specific area of the body, or generally throughout the body.
Although edema first appears to be a disturbance of water levels in the body, in many cases it occurs as a result of electrolyte imbalance. A lack of plasma protein commonly causes edema. Let's look at four causes of edema. Decreased colloid osmotic pressure, increased hydrostatic pressure, increased capillary permeability, and lymphatic obstruction.